Hey guys, and welcome to an Unfiltered Gamer uh, podcast. What would you call this, Brian? I don't, I don't know. It's a, a thing we're doing. Yeah, yeah, it's just a thing we're doing at this point. We're going to be talking about eight different games, four of mine and four of his. They're new games ish and uh we'll kind of go over what we thought about them kind of discuss them in certain ways talk about the qualities uh and what audience it might be for if any audience at all we might be disagreeing or agreeing based on what games they are we both have unique opinions on the games we like which i think will make for some good banter in these eight different games of discussion so the first game you want to talk about is my game of course and it's the stifling dark have you heard of the stifling dark uh, I have heard about it from you. Yes, because it's really good. The Stifling Dark <laughs> is a game that's similar to Letters from Whitechapel. It is like that Mr. X game, or is that the same game as the Letters game? Is it a separate one? He's, he's more board game knowledgeable than I am. Do you know? I don't know. You don't know Mr. X? <laughs> I don't know. There's there's another one with that. And then and then there's... Um, Mr. Jack. Mr. Jack? That's the that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Jack, okay. not Mr. Okay. Mr. X. Um, and then there's also... <laughs> Uh, Spectre Ops and uh, Fury of Dracula. All of those games are very similar in nature because they're hidden movement style games. Uh, the Stifling Dark is actually kind of like those, but you will be adding the twist of Dead by Daylight, which is a game that I really enjoy. The idea is four investigators, one evil villain, and you are attempting to either, as the investigators, defeat the villain, escape, or do some unique unique objective whether it be like get in the car and bash the gates or, or whatever and all you're equipped with really is is flashlights so you're going to be like throughout the turn moving around not knowing where the villain is throwing out your flashlight and hoping to find something it could be an item or a clue or it could be the bad guy himself if you get the bad guy you stun him uh and if not then the bad guy cannot walk through that space it's, it's really cool how it works um now basically the bad guy is going to be playing in kind of like a screen, a hidden board. He can utilize his own mini board, which is a replica of the main game board. And the bad guy is going to be taking his turns to move around and try and kill the investigators. And if he kills a certain number of people, then he basically wins. It's, it's a hidden movement game, but it's also a game about, like, it's also a game about completing objectives in unique ways that I've never seen before in a hidden movement style game. What did you think about it when you first saw the game? Uh, I mean, I, I thought that it looked really cool. I liked the um, the pieces there that I, I guess you have like a, um, a flashlight that kind of moves around the board and that designates certain areas where you can reveal the, the villain, I suppose. Um, yeah. But um, yeah. It, so basically, is it something you, when you saw the game, is it something you'd rather play over? Like you played Letters to Whitechapel. That's the only one I think you've played before. Would you rather yeah, well, pick this game up over that just based on how it looks? I mean, it looked cool. I love the concept. Um, I My biggest thing with like hidden movement games is, well, Letters from Whitechapel or what was it Mind Management? I always felt yep. the, the game really benefited. I know Mind Management, you can, um, you can adjust the difficulties there, and it, and it kind of does. It kind of helps manage itself. But um, I thought Letters from Whitechapel, when there was a really good player playing as, uh, as the, the murderer, it was almost impossible to find him. And maybe that's just, you know, us and we're, we're terrible at these games. Cause I was, you know, it's a, it's a cooperative game and it's one versus many, you know? And uh, so maybe I'm just terrible at these kind of games, but I, I felt like they were like, they're really difficult. Um, and so I, I was kind of curious how this kind of compares. I know you haven't played letters from Whitechapel, but I was really curious to see how it compared to those in terms of difficulty. If you can adjust that difficulty. If you're playing against the bad guy and the bad guy is very good, it's very likely you're going to be screwed. However, if you have one or two players who are really good at observing what locations the killer might be at, the killer can be easily thwarted in this game. The problem is with playing the killer, if you get that flashlight shown on you, you're basically going to lose your entire next turn because you need to get out of the flashlight and you're not allowed to do any actions while in the flashlight. So it, it, when you're in this specific area on the on the board and I've shown the flashlight on you, you're not going to usually be able to get to a person if they have their flashlight. You have to exit them and basically like go back into hiding. And if that happens three turns in a row, while the three other players go around collecting the objectives while these people are shining lights on you, it can be a drastic 
disimprovement for the killer. <laughs> it's, it, I, okay. I had it happen three times uh, in a row on my first game, and I felt like I had no way of winning until I had to start being more strategic in where I went and how I decided to try and defeat people. Having them split up was very important because it was easier to make sure the flashlights weren't all beaming in a complete area around me, you know? Yeah. And, and like because of that, I, I think it comes down to, yes, how good the bad guy is and, and the good guys, but it's really about the teamwork of the players. If you have a really bad team, you're probably going to lose this game, especially if the bad guy knows what they're doing, right? If you don't want to work together, then you're going to be in trouble. One person ran off on their own and did their own thing, and it cost the players the, the, the game, yeah. So you have to kind of right. be smart about it. But it's still, at its core, a hidden movement game. If you didn't like Spectre Ops or Letters from Whitechapel or Fury of Dracula, you're not going to like this game either. Uh, the unique twist on it with the Dead by Daylight theme is you have the killer and the killer is trying to do complete, like trying to defeat you guys. And you're trying to like either complete these generator type things around the map to open up the gates or you have unique ways instead of like the hatch, you can actually get in the car and bash the thing or you can actually defeat the killer. And then of course you have the flashlights that stun the killer, it, like blinds them, which happens in that game as well. And I just felt like it did a really good job of those type of that type of Dead by Daylight game. There's the Evil Dead game as well that came out. It plays kind of like that as well. And I think that uh, the people in that type of genre that like board games are going to want to pick up this game up as well. I was a huge fan, but I could be biased just because I really, really, really like those type of video games. And it, this translated to a board game very well. Yeah, I, I really thought that the, I, I like the idea of a potential like horror theme here. You know, there's a, there's some mystery and some danger going on. I love horror themed games. And I know that you really liked this game and i had uh, another buddy who really liked it as well so i'm, I'm actually my, my interest is really peaked okay well let's talk about a game that you like how about we talk about uh chronicles of evil evil am i saying chronicles that right? of evil chronicles of evil uh, yeah what is right it? So in this game, you're, you live in this fantasy world and you're part of a, uh, a group of explorers and you, you're traveling out into the world here. Um, it's, the board is made up of, um, of hexagons and you're, you're, just, you're, mo you're moving out into the board, you're fighting enemies and you're working to protect this castle from the coming of the beast. And the beast is this this creature who came out of the sky or something like that. And, um, and it's inevitable that he's going to come. But uh, during the, during the game, you're essentially building up your characters and um, strengthening yourself, fighting enemies. And they, they keep coming of course, cause you know, why wouldn't they? But, uh, and then, then you're setting traps and you're trying to build up the castle walls. And there's, there's a number of different ways you can try to, hold back the enemies who will eventually eventually uh begin to move towards you and attack and this is a this is a dungeon crawler tower defense heart. game as well it feels like based on how you're discussing you're, you're talking about like is it is it you're going into things or things are coming at you you're going into things initially so there is a certain number of rounds the game takes place and that's based on the player count and this is cooperative so everybody's kind of moving out um and um and you're looking and these these characters are being revealed on certain turns and then you're and then it's a dice combat situation but what really makes this game interesting one it's beautiful oh. it looks amazing the components are amazing but it's actually really more for families and children it looks so like a kids kind of, game too yeah that's it, what I thought. It, it is but i think it's one that can be enjoyed by by adults so i think it makes it really great for families looking to maybe get their kids into like a dungeon crawler type situation. And uh, the, the dice rolling, the dice feel amazing. Um, it's it's fun to battle the the enemies. It's not super complex, but overall the uh, the game's really clean. So it's there's not a lot of like little fiddly rules that are coming in here and there. Like this this villain does that. Everything is really straightforward. It's really simple. But uh, it's still a challenge because you're rolling dice. And uh, the, there, there are some really great positive pieces about this game. Um, there are actually quite a few. I like it's the artwork's amazing. The components are amazing. But what really, what really blew me away was, and it's kind of silly, but there's these character cards uh, or these character uh, boards. And the game comes with pads of, of like um, 
like adventurers. So you've got your guys and your girls. And so you can take those and your kids can color those. And then those will slide into these player boards. And so they're kind of pancaked in these player boards. And so you, this is like a double thick board. Or the, the One of the images as I have up currently has got like a sword and a shield. Is that kind of what it yes. is? Yeah. So, yeah, it is. Um, and that's what the, one of the cool things as you as you play the game, you're going to um, you're going to fight these these creatures and then you're going to get these upgrade tokens. And those tokens actually fit in that player board like puzzle pieces. So like a helmet fits over your character's head or the shield fits on his arm. And there's also like this backpack and you can only carry what you can fit in the backpack. And that's it's just really cool. There's like um, some like, drag or you can. Um, pull stuff out of bags and and you know and whatever you get is you know is the weapon that needs to go on your character so like that is i know that sounds silly but it's a really cool component to the game it, it makes it really attractive to kids and i had fun coloring my own character as well <laughs> uh, so yeah i mean it, it's it's a really well done game it's really great as an entry-level dungeon crawler um i think that I think eventually you could probably exhaust the game. I know there are different ways to set it up, but I think at that point your kids or maybe you are ready to move on to the next the next dungeon yeah, crawler. Yeah, so it's challenge. kind of like a gateway family friendly dungeon crawler with the aspect of being able to place things into your actual character. There's character customization in more than one way. And yeah. it's one of those kind of things that you can, after you finish playing this type of a game, you can move on to other games that your kids will start to understand more easily because they played Chronicles of Evil. That's right. Yeah. And and even for me, I, I don't play a ton of dungeon crawlers, but I have Gloomhaven in the waiting. It's waiting. It's ready. And now after I played Chronicles of Evil, I'm ready to play Gloomhaven. So uh, is that how it works? <laughs> That's how it works. Apparently. Okay. <laughs> so so what about your next game my next game is is called it's a game that that we've played before uh it's currently on kickstarter and it's called patriot by wild yep. robot games which you can back it's funded as of now you are playing as either the president or one of the president's cabinet members and you are attempting to stave off six days or five days of, of requests from an evil assassin attempting to assassinate the president. There's a request every day you have to fulfill. If you do not fulfill it, there's going to be some type of repercussion. And most likely, the president will die if you do not fulfill enough of the demands or if the assassin ever gets a chance just to do it. Uh, it's kind of a... I don't say worker placement, but I would say it's more of like an action management game. There are spaces that you can place your workers down on the board. And uh, you basically place your location, you put your character on the location, you take the action, then you move on. And you can place wherever you want, really. The only rule is you can't place where, like, there's going to be, like, rebels or, like, rioters. But otherwise, you're just spending actions to do things. There's four different areas on the board. You have, like, the war room section. You have, like, the... Uh, the satellite slash like probe section, you got the finances, and then you've got also the science area. And your objective is to like keep the peace, increase the money or your finances, and prevent uh, the threat level from going up. Because if the threat level goes up to six, then the president will be assassinated. It plays kind of like Dead of Winter, um, Shadows Over Camelot, BSG, even the kind of lighter BSG light, which I guess is called Dark Moon, uh, and where one of you in the cabinet is a bad guy. And they are sent to kind of cause havoc. They're going to be playing cards in secret along with the rest of the players trying to help out the other factions. And they're typically not going to be helping as much as you might think. Uh, hopefully they are able to defeat the president. Or if not, then they are going to lose and the president will succeed along with all the people in the cabinet, cabinet who are able to complete their objectives. Now there's two different types of people, right? You're going to have the green guys that just want to save the president. They don't care about anything else. And then you're going to have the yellow guys who want to save the president but might also want to cause a riot or two. Or perhaps they want to increase the treasury to a very substantial amount, which might cause a little bit of civil unrest. Or perhaps they might want to defeat or destroy a few probes that they were launched into the uh, into the stratosphere that uh, 
They maybe I don't know why they want to do these. They do bad things basically. So <laughs> it kind of like hides the bad guy in a way. And if you played any of these other games I've talked about, there's similarities to that. Playing cards into a pool, shuffling them up, revealing them, trying to get more positive numbers than negative, and succeeding and moving on. But the main game is just simply spend your action points, flip over a card, it'll tell you to do something. If you succeed, good stuff happens. If you don't, bad stuff happens. You'll go around and at the end of the round, you will see if you finish the main daily quest. After five daily quests, is the president still alive? If he is, you win. If he's not, well, it, it, that, that's not really good for the, the country, and I guess the assassin gets what he wants. Uh, this is a really good game. Uh, if you like any of those games I talked about before, this one is something I think you would enjoy as well. There is some quality production issues that I have, but it is a prototype, so I'm usually pretty lenient. I want to see some changes uh, with the area in which you see here on the screen. There is the threat level and there's the finances and the civil unrest area. Those need to be changed so it's easier to move those pieces. But other than that, the game's really straightforward. The bad guy is always easily able to be hidden and you're always kind of not trusting one player or another throughout mm -hmm. the entire game because people are doing bad stuff even when they're good and good stuff even when they're bad. If you like trader games, this is solid. It's going to have miniatures or standees. It'll kind of be your choice. And once you understand the basics of the game, it's really, really easy. So artwork, everything else, I, I really enjoyed. It's kind of one of those straight down the middle games for me. I really liked it. If you like games in this genre, you will like it as well. Yeah, and I, you know, we we played this as well, and my group really, really got into this. We really enjoyed it. Uh, a game that I would really liken it to is Unfathomable right now. Mm -hmm. um, it feels a lot like that, uh, w obviously with the hidden traitor, and then the eventual. Um, there, there could be eventually more hidden traitors, and you don't know. Um, and I also I, I liked the element that. Um, it's kind of that pandemic kind of thing where where those rioters keep coming. So you've got your objectives you got to fulfill, but you also got to get rid of those rioters. And so there's kind of a push and pull, and you're all kind of working together, maybe not. Um, so you're kind of trying to negotiate with each other to who's gonna who's gonna take care of the rioters or who's gonna do this or that. And then there's that hidden voting that uh, and that messes everything up sometimes. So, but uh, but when we played it. Um, we really the theme really like everybody was playing out the characters and the president was very presidential and you know it was it was really fun and we had a little bit of it. rp to the whole scenario right? yeah we did and i think that i think that's because the I, I, the theme is so interesting and so um baked into the into the characters and and um so it it, it plays i don't know it's just felt a little deeper for us so would you have you played um, Shadows Over Camelot or BSG? I, no, I haven't played that. No. Or, or BSG, Battlestar I Galactica. Haven't. Okay. No. Have you played any games where you take the cards, you shuffle them up, and then you reveal and you count the points on either side? Is this the first game you have played with that? Uh, no, no, I've played a few games like that. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Okay, that's um, what I was curious about because this is this system is pretty like a lot of mechanics in this game are fairly like things that you've seen before, but it's the way in which she put them together that was kind of unique to me. The fact that you could just take a boatload of actions and he gave you a ton of action points, I, that was my favorite part about the game. I like the RPing, I like the fact that each character has their own unique abilities, they're all very easy to use, there's once a game abilities, but just the ability to just go do 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 and I don't care where I can go wherever I want, do whatever I want, as yeah. long as there's no rioters there. And it was a lot more freedom, like, oh, yeah. oh, there's a character there in the in the in the base. I can't go in there. I don't fit, even though it's like twenty million feet tall. Like it just it made sense how 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 it all worked together. Right. Instead of like it's not like I'm going into a stall. Oh, sorry, somebody's like a lot of worker placements. Only one person can go to the vineyard because right, you know, only one person. It's, yeah. two, it's a two player game. <laughs> well, and one quick note that Unfathomable is a reimplementation. So that's like the new version of it, the reskinned version. So a reimplementation of what? Uh, of Battlestar Galactica. So mm. it's kind of it's it's kind of like an upgraded like Cthulhu kind of version of that of that game. Ooh, yeah, I, no, I, I, I don't know. It's fun. It's good. Okay. Okay. So Patriot altogether, though, solid game. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I I think one of the guys that uh, I played it with went out and backed it day one. So. Well, I guess there, they, there you have it. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Back to the game. If you're interested, there's a link down below as well. Next game is 
a game I am not familiar with at all. It's called uh, Garden Nation. So, right. Tell me. Yeah. So Garden Nation, um, there's there's a little bit of backstory here, so bear with me. So this community, and they're, I, I don't want to call them little people. They're like fairies, but they're not fairies. Anyhow, they all live together, and, and life was great. And I guess as families do, they get into Well, do they have issues. wings? Do they have wings? I got to know. You said do they have, I don't think they have wings. Okay, no. well, they can't be fairies then. So can they be imps? No, right. No fairies. Imp? <laughs> Is it an imp? So, so I'm it's, curious. It's, it's, it's what, Ty? I'm curious. I want to know. Is it an imp? If it's not a fairy, it's, is it an imp? Or is it a dwarf? I, I just, think this is where your imagination comes in, and you can, re you know. Okay, no, okay. They're just, oh, fine. They're just Good. little people. They're little people. They live in gardens, okay? <laughs> a gnome. It's a gnome. That's what they are. It's not a gnome. It's smaller than a gnome. <laughs> it's smaller than a bread box. Okay, imagination. So, okay. Tell me. So anyways, all right, so this this community, they decide to break up into four clans, and they're all going to go their separate ways because they can do life better by themselves, but the harsh reality of the world sets in, um, whether it's nature, whether it's just uh, a lack of resources, and they all come back together. So they're kind of reluctantly coming back together, and they decide that they're going to settle in this garden. And so the game takes place in this garden. Now, these people, they don't want to live together, but they kind of do. So they're kind of grumpy about this. And that's kind of the tone of the game. So uh, during the game, you're settling this area. And it's made up of six spaces on the board. And you're going to build these little homes. And they're all, and they're, the, the components are really cool. They're like these little plastic, they're pretty heavy duty. They're little plastic pieces and all, and every clan has their own way of building something. So maybe um, one of them is made up of like tin cans or another one's made up of, I don't know, just like like garbage or something like that. So they, so they build these things out and it's an uh, area majority game. And you're seeking to like kind of fulfill these objectives and the objectives will help you build more things or, or, or score points. And, and you tear down your, you build up, you build up your buildings and then you tear down your buildings to score these objectives. Okay? It looks like a family area control, but it's also a puzzle game, right? And you're like yeah, stacking little know. pieces. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really all about area majority. And I mean, everything plays off that there are, there are other ways to do things like you're spending population to move, um, to move people into these buildings and then you're pulling them back. So it's kind of a push and pull. Um, it's, uh, I mean, that's, that's basically what you're doing the and doing during the game, but there is really one standout element to this. And uh, it's the mechanic is called the torta crane. Okay. So they've taken this turtle. You and remembered this specific mechanics name is what you're talking about. Torta crane. Me. Yes. Is it a no, tortoise and a crane? <laughs> Is that what we're getting this at is here? There. This is this is pretty epic. It's going to live on. Okay. So, okay. So you got the torta crane, and it's it's souped up. It's tricked out to be this this like like miniature giant crane. Okay, because these are little people. Remember, and this tur this this turtle is huge, and it's moving around the board, and that's that's the place where they get to build. So, like I said, the the board is made up of these six spaces, and then each section in the board has six spaces, and each one of those spaces corresponds to one of the bigger six spaces in the board. So when you decide to build or take an action on one of those six spaces in that area, the torta crane moves over to another section on the board, on the bigger board, and then the next action takes place in that area. And a lot of times in the game, you're gonna have two actions in a row. So you, you take one action to benefit yourself, but you make sure that your next action is gonna benefit yourself as well. And then that action, you wanna play a more, a more defensive role and Make sure that when you pass on the, you know, to the next player, that they're not going to be able to to do something great with the torta crane. Okay. I so, thought originally when you said torta crane, my first imagine, I, I thought it was a tortoise that had a crane's wings, like a crane, like a bird. Uh, no, like a building crane. I know. I had to actually look up. I went back to the image to show everybody <laughs> to see, like, the, I wanted to see this big giant tortoise, and I'm like, okay, so it's a miniature that's literally a tortoise that has a a steel crane coming out of it and like sticking yes. out of it. And it just moves and, around from space to space. And like I said, it's like kind of tricked out and the whole game's like that. Everything's kind of made up. Of, I don't want to say trash cause it's not all trash, but like thimbles and, and little stuff like that, you know? Um, so 
in that sense, the theme is um, the theme is pretty cool um, in that regard. But um, but the problem with the game, okay, the problem is it's never really exciting. So you work toward these objectives, and then when you achieve them, oh, okay, I did that. Um, I had a few other problems. Uh, I felt like it was kind of swinging. Some of the objectives, like one objective gave you gave you 10 more points than another objective, but it really wasn't that much harder to achieve. So it just happened to be that the right person was in the right place at the right time. They got that mega objective, and suddenly they're way in the lead. But even when you got a mega objective, the game's kind of, it's kind of melancholy. And I think a lot of that has to do with the, the grumpy people, they're all grumpy in all the pictures and everything's kind of muddy, like the, the color palette's kind of muddy, which again, it looks pretty cool. It really does. But, you know, like a rainy day outside, it can kind of wear on you after a while. And I think that that led to um, the game just feeling kind of mellow. It's like and stagnation, would you say? Like over uh, Yeah, over I mean time. a little bit. I, I actually kind of, I really enjoyed the Tour de Crane, okay? But the rest of the game... Um, when you're spending the population, I never, it's supposed to be kind of a push and pull kind of thing where you run out of population. So you gotta, you gotta break down another building to get that population back so you can pursue another goal. And I, I just, I never felt like there was a lot of pressure there. I always felt like I had plenty of people. So I think if that was a little tighter, I think the game would have been a lot more interesting. Um, yeah, I, really... I see on their face what you're trying to say. Yes, I get it. Like, <laughs> but, but like, I think, so what you're saying is like for first time, people who just jumping into the game, this can be an enjoyable experience, but over a period of time, it might be something, you might, it's kind of a, a light gateway game, right? That you kind right. of Right, well, it's on. an area control game, but it's like the kindest area control game ever. Direct combat, I think there's one action where you could steal somebody's building. But other than that, I mean, it's a super gentle area control game the artwork's great like i said it's kind of muddy everybody's kind of a little grumpy um you may love that and i think it's i think this game is right for a lot of people um my it is not right for my wife and um and her grumpy attitude affected my play <laughs> i love it i love it when when you play with other people right and you're having yeah. I, I mean for me i can have fun playing almost any game but what i cannot have fun with is when other people are not having fun i feel like if you're not having fun i'm not going to be having fun yep. either Right, like, right. I, I can have fun in almost every game except for Monopoly with anybody. <laughs> I, I, I hate that game. I won't play it. Uh, it's I, awful. I, it's I, awful. I, I, I had to play the Islandopoly game. There's an audience for it. I know people like it. But I, 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 when you play with people that are super aggressive or whatever it have you be, you roll the dice and you just get unlucky and you sit there for two hours suffering. Um, it just reminds me of like it brings out the worst in a lot of people's like ambitions and – I don't have fun when they're not having fun. When people are getting picked on too, I don't have any fun. So I, I can see how that would work. And, and I feel like in this game too, you're saying it's kind of like eh, when people get grumpy over this type of a game, it's not going to be as enjoyable for the other people around. Would you right. personally play it with a different group of people or would you kind of pass it along just because after a while you've kind of gotten the feel for it and you'd like want to move on to something, something else? I, I'm probably passing this on. I really love that mechanic. I think that there's something great in store for that and it's probably used in other games i just haven't seen it but i really liked it because there is a real push and pull with every action um, i thought that was super fun but overall the game just never reached those heights for me fair enough okay let's talk yeah. about crusaders divine influence uh based on the original game crusaders thy will be done this is a expansion to the game crusaders thy will be done you have not played this yet but I'm going no, to be sending I'm you a copy. The first thing I'm going to do, though, is I have to explain to you the grandness of this game before you can enjoy it. You have to appreciate the gift that will be sent to you that is Crusaders Thy Will Be Done. Bring it, bring it. Crusaders Thy Will Be Done is a tableau management game, but in a unique way. You're going to have your own unique rondelle. It's going to be slices of pizza. So you're going to get this little piece of pizza, and you're going to be choosing a, a knight. Let me find the right picture. We've got one. You'll be choosing a knight, uh, and that knight is going to give you slices of pizza, and you're going to get a certain number of influence cubes on each of those slices. And we'll come to those pictures in a bit. You know, we'll have a picture of the knight. Just imagine the piece of pizza, okay? On the rest of the board is going to be all your buildings that you're going to be able to use when you're moving around the town. So you're going to start with a knight, and basically you'll choose any of the actions you want on your piece of pizza. You're going to pick all those cubes up, you're going to move them all around, and... Uh, 
you know, based on whatever action you choose, it's how many of that action you can take. So movement, I have three cubes. I'll pull them off, place them on each piece of pizza in a clockwise direction, and I'll get to move three times with my knight, or knights if I have more, and then I'll move my knight. If uh, there is a piece of pizza that has been flipped or upgraded, you have two actions you can take. Maybe it's going to be move and build. In certain areas of the game board, you can build. Sometimes you might have to fight first, and fighting is also going to be an action. Other times you're going to gain influence, etc., etc. The game is very straightforward how it's played. You pick up, you take your actions, and then you drop them around. And that will formulate new actions or more of a singular action. Maybe you can't build because you need to build for four and you only have three cubes there. So maybe you're going to move first, putting an extra cube on build, and thusly you move to the location you need to go to, and now you can spend your four cubes to build that chapel or cathedral, etc., etc. Mm. You're a crusader. Your objective is to fight for your realm. There are four different realms, and you are a part of one of them, and you're trying to defeat these guys. You're gaining victory points for each of the different factions that you fight at the end of the game you'll get points for not only the buildings that you put out and the influence that you gain throughout the game but also how many of each different faction that you fight you're never going to fight other players if me and you play together we're just going to be working together uh, as crusaders of the realm to defeat the other factions but the glory and honor will go to one of us uh, uh, me because trust me i beat you in this game no, just kidding this is a rondell game you actually would do pretty well at this game i would imagine i love rondells yeah. yes uh in the expansion it's going to include more stuff. It's one of those expansions where, because sometimes it's, it's one of the two, right? We have expansions that are like, okay, it's just more stuff I like, or here's a whole new thing. This one's kind of more of the same, but I love this game. And normally more of the same is no good for me. But in this time, in this instance, it works. Now there's some unique twists to it. Basically it gives you an extra board with four new types of buildings. And these buildings can only be built on locations with the previous buildings that you have built. So if you build a castle from the original uh, base game, there's going to be this little tower that you can place under it. And that's going to give you bonus points or bonus troops or bonus this or bonus that. Basically, it's like a building next to another building on each of the different spaces. So you're not going to have extra buildings to place in all the different areas because the main game board is still going to be the same. There's only so much room. So what they did was kind of an interesting thing where they added the ability to put two buildings. So you can actually form new paths. Instead of going with four buildings and choosing two of them, you could, or three of them, or even all four if you really wanted, but you'd be kind of stretched thin. Maybe you would go with like two of the original base game buildings and then their expanded buildings that can be kind of attached to each other. Now, instead of when you get gather influence from the base game, which was really lazy and kind of lame, which is like, I have four cubes on influence. I'll move the four cubes off. I'll gain four influence. That's victory points at the end of the game. Hooray, my turn is over. Now... You are going to spend those four influences for uh, an influence token that is going to be included in the game on your knight's location. And hopefully in this image, there is. You, did, you, good, you picked the right picture. It's with the expansion. So you can see on the right-hand side of each of the hexagons, two, four, six hexagons. Yes, <laughs> there's going to be infinite cubes. On the bottom of them, or, or should tokens, there's going to be a number. That's how many cubes you need. You're going to gain the banner's worth of influence, and you'll get a unique bonus effect that happens in the game. And you'll collect those as well, and if you have the most of them at the end of the game, you'll get more bonus points. So now it's made all of the actions useful and good. And I'm not as bored with the two actions that I didn't like as much in the old version of the game, which is the movement, which has been improved now, and the influence, which now gives you something to do, collect, and give you bonuses. These these pieces give you bonuses to like building or, uh, I don't know, you're being able to get new troops, etc., etc. This is a, at its heart, a rondel game, but it has a unique area control mechanic. It's kind of like a battling game, but you're not battling against each other. You're just trying to battle it out against the, the you know, the bad guys of the realm. And you're going to try to get more points than all the rest of those guys. The game's actually really quick. It's very simple once you understand it. It's probably a medium weight game, but I've had the girls, they sat down and played it. They never played it before. I went, here's the rules. It took me five minutes and then we went off and no one actually had a question. They even figured out some of the rules as we moved along because it was so basic. The, the, the banners are all victory points. How many victory points do I get? Where's the banner? They know what it is. How much does it cost? It's in the hexagon. And that was really, really nice about this game. They made it so streamlined. And then of course the quality, the artwork, I love it all. It's good. You like a Rondell? Area control game? Crusader's Night will be done. And throw in Divine Influence to make just the actions that much better. And some bonus buildings that 
are on top of other buildings. So, yes, I, th I think you would like it. Have you seen yeah, the game? Yeah, no, it sounds awesome. Yeah, I mean, I've heard so many good things about this game, and I, I think uh, TMG uh, used to used to own the rights to this, and, of course, they went under, and I think Renegade is... Yeah, Renegade now owns the rights to the game, TMG. Yeah. Lance, uh, the Undead Viking... I don't know if you know who that reviewer is. He's yeah, been, yeah. Been, okay, so he was, he's been my buddy for years now. He actually was the first person to send me the game. And he, he even promised me the deluxe version, but then he had he left TMG like literally a month later and broke my heart. It's okay, though. <laughs> I have a few copies of it, and I will be sending them out to one lucky member. I'm going to have a giveaway at some point for one of them, and I've got one for you as well. And I might, I might even throw in the expansion for you so you can have the full experience because I don't know when the girls are going to honestly play with me again as much yeah. as I do like it. I think, I think well, playing with the expansion is cool. good. It's cool to hear you, uh, you know, speak so positively about the expansion. A lot of times, uh, some of my favorite games, once I implement that expansion, it's not the same game anymore, you know? And, and, and I say that it's not the same game because it's not as good. You know, um, so it's it's nice to hear about a an expansion that actually creates not just meteor decisions, but um, but fulfills a purpose within the game. And I mean, to be fair, though, this expansion is not going to renovate the game. What mm. it does is it adds, it adds a bunch of extra buildings you're probably never going to use. I didn't even use them. The girls tried to a little bit and that's fine. Like, I'm sure there's a way to use them. I'm just not smart enough to do it. But what it does add that I really, really liked was it changed an action that was boring into something that wasn't boring. It didn't mess with any of the core mechanics of the game or extra pieces of setup other than placing all the influence tokens on each of the, t the spaces. But I like that. It was really good. So mm, yeah. it's, it's, I'm not going to ding it too much for that. But it's really, really simple. And it doesn't change any core mechanics or make anything like bogged down. There's no like 8 million extra hours put into this expansion once you know the base game and you put the expansion next to it, you don't actually have to read the rules to understand the game. I mean, you, yeah. you might want to, but honestly, if you played the base game a few times, like I just set it up and I'm like, okay, this is what this does. Oh, let me check the rules just to make sure. Okay, I was right. And, th and that, that was what I kind of liked about it. I wasn't super worried about like, uh, how does this change the game? Is this going to affect my strategies from before? Right. And it doesn't do any of that. But it's also not super innovative, which I think in this case is actually a good thing because if I had an extra like double, you know, two more boards to the game and 50 more figures and it, it turns a, a medium weight, really cool mechanic a, a game that's really simple and easy to something that gets, it's bogged down. It gets like, it gets too much for what the game is right. asking to give you. You don't want to turn a light Euro into a heavy Euro. It doesn't work because the people who want it in the first place aren't going to enjoy that experience because they're going to be like, what the hell is this? Right. And that's mm. the problem. So yeah. I, I think for the most part, if you have played the base game, this is an expansion that you will enjoy, but as an expansion, you do not need if you do not want it. Although I do honestly hate that influence action. And this, this gets really Okay. So. <laughs> I've mentioned it a lot because honestly, it's really bad. Okay. okay. So I, I, I got nothing else to say about it. You want to say anything? Otherwise we'll move on. No, let's move on. Uh, yeah. Right. So um, my next game is uh, Terracotta Army by Board and Dice. And um, this one looks this... dang good. And I was hoping to get it and you got it. So you better tell me you liked it or else there's going to be trouble. Well, I, I was going to build up to it, but I love this game. It okay. is amazing. Uh, okay. I love Board and Dice. Uh, I love this designer. This game is amazing, and uh, so I, I spilled the beans right there. Um, Good. I wanted to know because I, yeah. I, I, I've seen all these Born Dice games on my website, and I'm like, what are these games? Why are they so cool? Uh, you better enjoy this one. This one looks damn good. Yeah. I really like Born Dice because they create a lot of, like, ancient Greek and ancient everything. Yeah, it's ancient history games. behind it. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. High um, quality. Yeah. Everything, yeah. This game might have to show up at your door for Christmas. Yeah. Um, so here, let me give you the backstory of the game here. So the the emperor, this is ancient China. The emperor has died, and um, you've been tasked with um, building these terracotta statues. So uh, that to place in the tomb with with uh, you know with the emperor. And um, so what what these were originally done is they they built these terracotta warriors so they would protect the emperor as they moved into the afterlife. And so in the game, you're you're gathering resources. 
you're utilizing your workers and some specialists and um, you're kind of, um, I don't know, working in this, this um, you know, in, in the tomb there to basically set these um, these soldiers or these uh, these army members or whatever they are, their statues um, in a way that pleases the uh the emperor's people, his his advisors. So well, because the emperor kind of is gone now, this. right? You're trying to build his tomb, right? The, the emperor has died, and yeah, and so he's placed in the tomb, and and they, like I said, they they put these statues in there with him, and though they were supposed to protect him in the afterlife, right? right. So, um, and it, originally, all the statues were actually all unique. So each one of these uh, terracotta um, warriors were all unique in this game there are only so many unique statues but um but you get the idea um so in this game it is it is kind of an area majority game uh it's a worker placement game it's definitely there's definitely some resource management and uh there's a lot of things going on there takes there's a lot of planning but it's so rich and meaty it looks pretty um, heavy it's is it a heavier game it's a little heavier it's it's I mean, compared medium, to all the rest of the games we've been talking about today, it's definitely heavier than those. It's it's not. I wouldn't necessarily consider it a heavy game, but it's getting there. So this is this is teetering on that. Um, some might consider it a heavy game. I think um, most board and dice games are teetering on heavy. They're like medium to like heavy. I, th I think that's for the most part those games. Right, right. Well, I mean, and, and if you've played like Takanu, it's definitely not as heavy as Takanu, but it's. Uh, I don't know, Zulkin, it's not, it's definitely heavier than, I know that's all, but, you know, um, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's kind of in the middle there a little bit. It, it's definitely a little heavier, but like I said, there's, it's, it's, it's not sensitive. Lisboa heavy, right? That's, no, we're not no, jumping no, no, not over at all. There. Not like, uh, not any like of those assertive games. It's not like that. Um, it's, it's really, it really comes down to your planning. Uh, the complexity of the game isn't really in the gameplay. The complexity of the game is in the scoring. And there's some really interesting ways that you score in this game. So uh, on your turn, you're, there's these three rings, and you're, you're choosing one of these spots on these three rings. I think there are like 13 spots to choose from. And so you play there, and then you get each one of these actions, and you take them in, in order. And there's some really great stuff here. I mean, I felt like I was doing something really cool every turn of the game. Uh, but the truth is, everybody's doing something really cool. It's who's doing the coolest thing or who's doing the best thing for them. So you're, you're taking these actions, and they may give you money. They may give you um, clay. And it's interesting, clay in the game. So, yeah, you can build a statue with wet clay but it will dry out after the turn. So you have to keep it wet. And, and there's just different ways that, that um, it's like maintenance that it, there is some maintenance there. And so you're kind of balancing that. And, and it's a resource management because some of the actions that you want to take, well, obviously to build a statue, it's going to take clay. A lot of things are going to take money. So if you hire out these, um, these specialists, they will give you uh, additional help, additional bonuses, and then they'll give you, re they'll reciprocate that each turn. So you hire these specialists. And so you're kind of chaining actions. So as you take those actions in the future, you're still getting that action, but you're also getting that end of, uh, end of round, beginning of round bonus. And then, so, so there's, there's all this activity going on as you, as you take these, um, you know, take these resources, but then you actually go over and you start building these statues and the statues, you get points for, for building the statues for, for starters, and the the more statues that disappear, the less points you're going to get. So you, you're going and you're placing those on on the, in the tomb on this grid. It's so this big grid, and it's broken up into four uh, different uh, different quadrants. And like I said, the game is fun and it's great. But where it gets really interesting is with the scoring. Every end of round has specific scoring for that. So maybe it's if you have a certain type of warrior, if you have the most type of warrior on the board, you get these bonus points. Or if you have the most in this section, you get this bonus point. And then there, there are also tokens that you can, every time you build something, you can spend that token and you get another bonus. And so it all comes down to you planning those actions. But it's interesting because everybody's doing these long-term plans and you have these great ideas for how you're going to succeed in the game but then that the where the that resource ring those rings rotate and you can manipulate those to an extent but you still got to think on your toes because when it comes time for you that action may not be available those rings might have turned and you've got to you've got to decide on the spot what's going to be best for me and you would think that would be that would really induce like uh 
some overthinking and some analysis paralysis. But the game plays, it moves pretty smooth. It does ratchet up as the game goes along. The moves or the turns get tighter. But uh, I don't know, man. I, I really, I felt really good. It feels like it's like a turns. slow, meticulous, the very beginning, like getting what you need in order to kind of like, basically you want to put those statues in the area. So you, you're getting your you resources do. to build those. Is that the main thing is like those statues getting in there? Is that like what you Yeah, you're and that's, that, like, so that's kind of an area control, you know, game, but you can like you can get bonuses when you build some to move them around as it progresses. So you might be able to move them in different areas. And um, of course then there are there are all these different scoring goals at the end of the game. So can you block uh, people when you move those statues around? Can you affect you can other block people. And then and then there's bonus like bonus statues you can build this giant horse and this horse will just like hog a bunch of spaces on the on the on a tile or something like that. So um and then there's like these other statues that will give bonus points or, or do different things. Uh, there's so many different ways to score in this game. It is, oh, I love it. I absolutely love this. Um, and like I said, I mean, like those meaty turns, I feel so good. I didn't win the game, which I rarely win games. I just, I like to explore the game. I think that's my problem. I just, I don't, I can't focus on one particular thing because what fun is that? I want to do everything. And of course you can't do everything in a game like this. So uh, here I am losing games, right? But I still loved it. I still love the actions. I still love the turns. And uh, it's just, it's a lot of fun. I, I really, really love this. If you, if you do like those board and dice, those heavier Euro games, this, this is one of the best of the year, in my opinion. So. Now, would you say it's in your top three games that Board and Dice has ever made? Oh, it's tough. I hate to I hate to do that knee jerk thing, like, oh, this is the best game I've ever played. So, but right um, right now, you feel very like heavily excited. Top three. It's very yeah. It's, yeah. In, it's in the top three. Okay. Yeah. If I was like, okay, we're playing a Board and Dice game. Which one do you want to play? What would be your first answer? Oh man, uh, man. That's tough. I mean, I really like Takanu. It's really heavy. I don't, we don't get we don't play it much because my wife thinks it's too heavy. Um, yeah, so does mine. It, yeah, and it, it is. It's heavy, you know. Um, but I really like the decisions. I like just you only have so many actions that entire game, and and same here. You know, you only have so many people that you can play on the board. So you know, you've got to be very careful. Uh, very, very resourceful and maximize each action. I think board and dice, they put out games that all have a similar style. They have unique mechanics and everything, but when I see a board and dice game, I know what I'm going to expect. It's going to be a little meatier. It's going to have a little bit more choice on my, your turns. It might be heavier in some degree, and it's going to have a unique twist. It's going to have a rotating this or that, or some type of thing that moves, or pl how you play something. And I like mm -hmm. that. I feel like I'm guaranteed to know that they are telling me what they're going to produce. Like this next game, right. I've already played, I don't know, a bunch of their games. I've liked each one and each one I play is different, but it's the same experience. It's kind of like watching a Marvel movie and I'm like, okay, yes. I, I expected that. I'm, I'm going to watch this next one. Oh, this was a little bit worse or a little bit better, but okay. I still enjoyed it, you know? Right, right. Yeah. It's like eating pizza. Even when it's bad, it's good. I mean, yep. this is definitely. And, um, the designer here is the designer who did Lord Pelias and he did Nemesis. Um, he did the last game he did for them was game. Origins, um, which I actually got on the shelf behind me there. Uh, it's uh, and and that that was one of those that it wasn't as good as some of the other board and dice game board and dice games, but it was really good. It was just kind of a, a little bit different dice placement game. Um, I think that there's a ton of value with board and dice as well. You get. Maybe it doesn't have like an in insert or something. Everything is like in bags in board and dice games. But you, know, you, you get a it. lot of game. That's right. what you get a the, lot For of. the price, I can't think of anything better. Uh, board and dice is probably my favorite publisher out going right now. So. What, what I would suggest is that somebody should cover inserts for these guys. Like, so you can go and buy the inserts. Because, yeah, their inserts they do. suck. They do. They, they have, have them. Sucky, they have third-party inserts. Yeah. But. See, the, the base game... The components are nice. Usually, it's usually thick cardboard with some dice or whatever, but the inserts are crappy. But the games are usually always, which is true. But the games are usually really, really, really good. I haven't found a board and dice game that I was like, "Oh, I'm not playing that again." Like I just haven't right. found it, and that's the testament to how good they are at making games. And I mean, I've had some where my wife has said she's not playing that again, but it's never because it wasn't a good game. 
It's because right. it took four hours. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know. I, I will say I will say one thing about Terracotta Army. Um, there is one one negative to it, and it's the miniatures. So these statues. It's not necessarily the sculpts because they're they're done fairly decent. The sculpts are pretty cool. It's there. Are, there are some some areas where like a soldier has a, a spear or something, and that spear does isn't quite straight. And I think some <laughs> I, I, I've got it pictured whatever, on on know, the. They can see it right now. They can see the the miniatures. Yeah, yeah. right. They're they're a little and, bit and I tried to, like a toothpick that's kind of bent. Yeah, I'm not ready to anoint Board and Dice as the next like great miniature producing, you know, publisher. But <laughs> they work. They're good. They still look good when they're all clustered in that tomb. They look they look pretty cool. You can I'm, paint not, them. I'm not gonna lie. So you could just, just paint them and then you know get some sculpting putty and add like a hammer to it. Maybe <laughs> or it's just a... make my own. Shoot, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just, you just gotta improve upon the design. No, they, yeah. but they're not known for the miniatures. They're known for really solid right. games that are fun to play. They're usually on the medium to heavy side, and a lot of choice, a lot of actions. And yeah, I, I, if you want a game that's you know that like thick Euro-y feel, and you want it to be good, you can always pick one of their games, and it's gonna be solid. Uh, right. Terracotta Army, though, is definitely one of those in your opinion. Thumbs, yeah, thumbs up. This is an amazing game. I, I just can't wait to play it again. What's up on the... We got two more left. Two more. Right. We're running up... We're, we're at 50 minutes, which is pretty good. I think that's like an average podcasty time, right? About, about an hour? Yeah, I mean, I think I think people can navigate through. You may even put... We'll do little... little. Yeah, we'll do little cuts so you can listen to each of our different things. Yeah. And then I'll hide right. this portion of the conversation. Like, so you guys have to deal with that unless you're just watching all the way through, which thanks. Roan Invasion. Roan Invasion... This game, it funded, right? Has it funded? I hope so. Uh, I don't know. Let's find out right now. Go ahead, look. I can't look because I've got all this stuff going on my computer, but Roan Invasion, I'll talk about it while, while he looks. Roan Invasion is a... Oh, okay. I don't have images. i got to edit at least one image of, of Roan Invasion. It's okay. I've got one right here. But Roan Invasion is a Yeah, this is a cool-looking game. It's really good. It's really cool, really good. It is a... Oh, no. I cut your face off for a oh, second. 12 days to go. It has not backed yet. Oh, it... I... It's, I, it's about $12,000 short. 12000 of its $58,000 gold. I don't know. I don't have an image for it. That's why I didn't post it. I didn't download it. Oh, I, I know. I sent you one. I'm, I'm sure you did. I probably just didn't... I didn't download But let me tell you about it. Roan Invasion, which is... There's, a many, there's many different Roan games. And they've all funded so far. This one is kind of a deck builder of sorts. And it's a dice builder. You're going to be gathering uh, ten, uh, 10 cards in your deck, just like any other deck builder. And then you're going to gather recruits. These are cards that are going to go into your deck, hopefully. They'll start they'll going to your discard first. They'll go into your deck. But the way it works in your turn is, without going through the details, you're going to roll dice. Those dice will have pips on them. You're going to use those pip colors for resources. The resources are going to allow you to either store them for later, which is going to be a two-for-one value, or you can use them to spend to play on cards. You'll play your cards, you'll gain scrap metal, and you'll do whatever the cards say. And the cards are gonna do damage to your opponent. There's You have armor and health, and it's kind of like your army versus theirs, but in like dice and card form. And your cards are going to be doing like range damage, which will affect just the health instantly, or melee damage, which will hurt the armor. Her armor gets to zero, then it goes to the health. You wanna get your opponent to zero. And you're gonna be building your deck and your dice to do so. Because after you've played all your cards and you've recruited any units that you can, and you'll be using screws to do this. You'll be using screws to be screwed into the dice, which will give you like more pips to give you more resources when you roll them to play more cards. And you're also going to be using them to recruit warriors. When you recruit them, you're going to have a certain number of screws and they'll go into your discard pile. And as you build your deck, your deck is going to get better. And as you build your dice, you have to get it's going to get better as well. And you have different options between the two and what cards you recruit. And when you recruit cards, you're going to draw three from the top, choose one of them, and discard the other two. And that will form your recruitment. And you're also going to get bonus actions with screws at the end of the game, or scrap, I should say. Every card that you play is generally going to have some type of scrap. And you can spend that scrap to upgrade your dice, improve your commander or your like technology because you're gonna get a certain number of like leader cards in the game 
And then you can also improve stuff like adding more screws or recruiting more cards to your deck. Uh, you can, there's all kinds of things you could do. So there's like multiple different resources. If you save resources and use them for later at a two for one, that's not actually bad because when you trade two, one, two for one for a blue, it might give you like a bonus to doing extra damage to your opponent or being able to gather an extra resource or extra scrap, et cetera, et cetera. There's ways to recycle cards. And the last thing that's really interesting about this game, other than there's an entire solo mode campaign and or cooperative mode, which I won't even get into because there's too much, but when your deck empties, you're going to reshuffle like you normally do in with your discard pile, but you're also going to have something called like the, the dumpster pool or whatever it's called. It's like a separate discard area that your opponent is typically going to make you put in there. And the other way is whenever you do not play a card from your hand, because when you start the game, you don't draw five cards like normal. You draw as many cards as you want. So you can draw your entire deck. The problem is if you do not play the cards in your hand because you cannot afford them, they're going to go into your like your graveyard area, or your like junk pile, hmm. as opposed to your discard pile. And when you reshuffle, all of those cards are going to do damage to you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. and, and in addition to that, Every time you reshuffle, your opponent is going to be able to gain all their units and their all their all their like leaders and their tech is going to like untap. I'm just going to call it that. Sorry, but you, to be able to use it again, so you can activate them again, and they're going to gain tokens that will allow them to gain extra resources. So going through your deck too quickly can be detrimental and in fact kill you. And it has killed me in previous games. So it's dice building, it's deck building, it's attacking. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on, but the game's actually really simple. Rolling, gathering, placing down, and, and, and passing. And it's got a little bit of push your luck. How many cards do I draw? The more cards, the more I have opportunity to use things. Some of your cards can be free that you purchase. It's it, it's really, really cool. I, I, I'm surprised this game hasn't funded day one, honestly, because... Uh, it has a lot to offer. It's very, very strategic. And I think it's it's going to be in my top five of the year for sure, for certain. Mm -hmm. And both the gals have played as well and is in their top five as well. And this is a kind of a, a meteor game, which they typically don't like. And it played, we played one game for three hours. It was like, <laughs> it was like building as much, because you can play, once you win or lose, you keep everything that you have and you go on to the next game and you reset your health. So you can kind of like increase your deck and increase your dice. So you don't always have to like reset the game, which is really cool. Mm. So you can play okay. best two out of three. And there's also a campaign mode, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, Roan Invasion is excellent. It's really, really fun. And you saw it. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, the artwork looks really good. I love that idea, the push your luck idea of the, of the card. I, I just love that. I think that, um, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, a deck builder that also makes you push your luck. I've seen it in like Mystic Veil vale and stuff. That's probably my favorite game of all time. Um, just because I love solitaire games that you play with other people. And there's not a whole lot of those. But <laughs> yeah, this yeah. game's kind of like that in, in, in some ways. It's not about, you know, converting your cards and all that. But it's more about like, do I want to spend my resources on recruiting units and getting more cards uh, so that way I have a better deck? Or do I want to build my dice up so that when I roll all these dice, I won't be getting blanks anymore and I'm going to get a bunch of resources that I can play my entire hand. But if I do, my deck's going to empty. And I'm going to take damage and I might have to reshuffle and give my opponent bonuses. And like you're constantly thinking about all this while yeah. the rounds are very simple. Yeah, no, it sounds really cool. Um, yeah. So that's... I mean, it's 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 like the third in its line. I haven't played the other Roan games, but it actually enticed me to do so when I at first didn't even know if I was really interested or not. I'm like, I don't really know what these are. Are they like deck builders or whatever? And then they sent me this one, and I was like, damn, this is good. Why is it called Roan Invasion? Oh, there's three other ones? Oh, I want to actually try those now. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm excited. I think I still might have my copy. And if I do, I guess the good news is either way, I'm going to be able to keep the game because I really like it. <laughs> well, the bottom line is it sounds like people need to get out there and back them, um, or at least take a look at it and see yeah. if it's right for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's got a lot of crazy stuff in it. And it, I guess the negatives are you got to screw and unscrew dice. You have to reset cards. I mean, there's some, like, tediousness to it, I suppose, but... For the game that you get in there, it's it's really cool. I, I haven't seen the pricing or all that. I don't know what the costs are. Maybe it's like higher priced or 
I don't know. I have to look and see the campaign again. I looked through it. It looked good. Um, but there must be some reason, because I don't see why people aren't picking this game up, because I really, really liked it. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm still looking through this Kickstarter. Um, yeah. I don't know. Hmm. It doesn't, doesn't seem to be a doesn't seem to be a problem I see here. So oh. well, I guess here's your opportunity then. Last and final work. game. Here we go. Is my father's work. Um, this is um, by this Renegade. Is a, by Renegade. Yeah, and this is a. I know that it was Kickstarter, um, but you can pick it up on their website right now. It seems like it's hard to find, but you can pick it up on their website. So you just go straight to them and you can purchase it. Um, and so this is a, a, a heavy narrative driven game. Um, it's worker placement. You're this family that's descendants. So your cousins, everybody who plays the game is a cousin and they are descendants from this mad scientist and they have come back together and they've discovered uh, that, uh, that he was working on this great project. This, uh, and it, it could, it could vary from game to game. It might be, a time machine or it may might be um like a love potion or or any of a variety of things mad scientists will work on um so you guys it, it's not cooperative but you're kind of walking through the story together and you decide you're going to take on um your your father's work and you're going to complete it and so it's kind of a legacy game in some regards it takes place over three generations and how those three generations play out varies um, there are three scenarios in the game, and I know that there are multiple ways to play each game. And it can be from just like a interaction with somebody in the game. So it's app based, and so you're you're doing a lot of your actions through the um, your, the narrative through the app. But the the game the gameplay is on the board, and uh, it has this big book, and you're you're flipping the book, and it's um, it's the same location, it's this village, but it's how the village has changed based on the circumstance of the story. Um, like I said, it's it's very like the the narrative is very heavy, and I was a little disappointed in the app. You you, you open it up and you start playing it, and you, you pick a voice, it's a male or female, and they start reading to you. And there's only two or three times that they read to you in the entire game. So I wanted them to read to me everything because there is a lot to read in this game. And I know that some people have chosen to kind of skip over some of those things. But I think you miss out on a lot of stuff because a lot of your decisions in the game come from the story. So if you go to the um, you go to the barracks or you go to the town hall and how you interact with people, um, it's going to affect the decisions that you make later on. And each person gets to make their own decisions. So, you, you know, you are all together and you are all making decisions together, but you're also, you know, your own path, your own your own path is moving through the game. So anyways, I mean, it's very thematic. Um, it's one of the most beautiful games I've I've ever played. I mean, there's these little glass containers in there. Um, I mean, I don't know what you do next. I, I think, you know, you get a game maybe with fine China and you eat, uh, you know, some steak or something. That's that's the only reason, only way you can actually move up from this. So the components are amazing. The miniatures are fine, but they're still they're still really good. They're they're. I mean, it's all standard. They're washed. Um, there, there's basically everything you can think of in this. There's, you know, this batch of wild animals and ev like there's 20 of them and they're all completely different. Um, so the, the components are amazing and playing the game just with the components, uh, you just, you feel drawn into the theme. Um, of course the app's playing and there's music in the background. So you're really drawn into the theme. I'm starting uh, to sense a kind of a butt in some regard here because you're discussing <laughs> well, like certain things that are like really cool in the game, uh, miniatures and the production and whatnot. But I'm like, I'm, I'm feeling like there's a buildup here. What's the, why that transparent? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so well, well, let me, let me tell, uh, tell you a little bit about what you're doing. So you've got these okay. different characters and they can, they can either go out into the village and they can collect resources or they can go to your your uh, your castle or your home and they can take actions in there. Some of them can only do one or the other or sometimes you'll lose characters and you'll have to gain it again. But essentially throughout the game, it's a it's a set collection game where you're you're creating you're, you're fulfilling these mini experiments and then you're building up and you kind of it kind of builds like a little bit of a tableau, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so th essentially, that's that's what you're doing throughout the game. Now, each scenario uh, brings different things into it. So 
Um, there's like a one about a war between it's like a civil war and you have to choose if you want to follow the government or you want to choose to follow the people, uh, the rebellion sort of thing. And and each each thing is going to have its pros and cons and each thing's going to affect each decision you make is going to affect, you know, sometimes you personally, what you what, um, you know, what uh, your father was working on is going to affect how the game moves forward so in that play in in that regard it's really cool i think where i where i struggle with it's totally with the story um it's it's a lot to read and it 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 probably added 30 to 45 minutes onto our gameplay just reading the story just just reading is it like does it like is it like a, a, a narrative from the app that it talks to you or do you have to read it yourself well that's the thing like i said that uh the narrator who comes in right away and think that they're going to read the entire thing there's only like two or three places that they actually read and so you're stuck reading reading it and then sometimes it's pages after page and it's 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 well written i don't want to say it's not well written but the language used in it makes it a little bit hard to read they wanted to make it very authentic to the like time period english kind of feel yeah and it uh some of the vocabulary um i mean i i, I I'm, I'm not a total idiot but, um, you know, so it, it kind of makes uh, digesting what you're reading a little bit more difficult. I know I played with, uh, with my family and uh, my younger daughter, who's, who's a little younger. I mean, she's 10, but um, she, she struggled a little bit with that, I know. Uh, and I don't think the game's typically intended for 10-year-olds. But, no. Um, but but that, was, that was unfortunate because it really slowed the game down, slowed the gameplay down. At its heart, it's, it's a fine worker placement game. The, the components are amazing. You feel it feels really rich and really involved. And I know that some of the stories are better than others. It's just it, it really slows it down. Now, if you're willing to invest the time into that, I think you're going to love this. I think, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be fantastic. In fact, um, it's. Like there's so much love put into this game and they've really thought everything through the dual layer boards. Um, there's like foil on the cover of the, of the book of, uh, with the maps on it. I mean, it's, you know, it's really cool. There, there's some, there's some cool mechanics uh, in that regard to how it just looks and how it plays and how it well, feels. When I first saw this game and I saw the quality and they were asking about reviewing, I was like, I want, I jumped on this instantly. At first I thought it was a Frankenstein's game. I mean, my father's well, work is. is. Yeah. Okay, it is. So there's like, there is a Frankenstein you can make. Or okay, it's, it's kind of a Frankenstein. Yeah. Okay, and I was I I delved more into it to see the quality, and the quality of the game looks really really good. So it's 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 been piquing my interest ever since, especially yeah. because Halloween has been coming up, and I need to find the perfect horror games for the stream and for right. reviews and all that. And so this one looked like really really cool, and I feel like. It the, the story. Do you have to read through the whole story? Is that like a requirement you, to play the you game? You don't. You don't. But I don't think that you're going to get. I the mean, full experience. I just don't think you're going to get the full experience because, again, like I said, each one of those, each one of these, like uh, different mini uh, experiences, like they're they're different storylines that you play out. It comes with all these different components, all these different tokens that you, that are just specifically for that scenario. So as you play out that scenario, you may or may not use those based on your decisions. But uh, you know, sh- should I spend this? Should I not spend this? Do I need more of these? Should I should I talk to that person? And I think I really feel like you're cheating yourself if you don't do that. But but at the same time, it bogs the game's time. It does down. bog the game down. And like I said, if if you are willing to commit, and you love these kind of narrative driven games, I think the games like one twenty, one twenty five on Renegade, it's worth it. I mean the 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 value in the components, the box, uh, it's it's definitely worth it. Um, for for us and for me, where we're at right now, it's probably not right for us. It it also doesn't have a solo mode which i could see myself maybe playing this again but i don't know i would i would have to find you the right can't group. get the family to play it again basically it's just too I, long and i cannot yeah yeah well that, that, that i feel like that like kind of revolves around a lot of your decision making unless the game is like an i love it game for you the, if, it, if it's not an i love it then it's can the, the girls like it is it something i can bring out and if the answer is no then it's gotta go right 
Yeah. I feel, for, for me, that's usually the rule as well. Most of the games, they usually go to the garage. But any games that you see there in the, in the corner of my, my room here, they're games that I know people will play again. Because mm-hmm. personally, I will play literally anything. I mean, except for Monopoly. Anything <laughs> else, though, I will play. Um, so I, I keep the ones that are around that are kind of like the evergreen games that, or at least for us, are evergreen. It's not, you're not going to find Contagion right. and all that stuff out here, but you will find games that we play consistently. So it's well, about this game. This game has done everything it possibly can. It has amazing... You pull them right out, but set up and tear down still takes time. This is an event game. You have to be committed to it. You have to have the right people that are, are willing to dive into it and to and to just enjoy it for what it is. And I, I do think that there's a lot of value there. Um, like I said, for me, it's it's something that I'm glad I played, but it's probably not something that would, would get to the table very often at all. I think even after this, I think for me personally, it'd be still something that I would have on the top of the list for horror games because I like narrative games. I mean, I have literally all of them except for time stories. Now, will I be able to play it all that often? maybe not based on what you're saying because i don't know if they're gonna yeah. be down for it if it's a lot of reading like that but maybe they would i don't know i don't know like because i feel well, like if it's a the light worker placement kind of feel and it's got a lot of unique twists and turns to it i don't know I'm, i haven't been t- turned away from what you're saying like it all right. sounds really good it's just well, and there's tons of personality and it's, i'm not just talking about the components like the uh these things that these the experiments that you can do, they're all individually themed. They're all like, you know, something bizarre, but they're all kind of pulled from different horror films and stories. And so there's so much personality and there's so much, like there's just so much love put into this that I think um, I think it's going to be, I think a lot of people are going to love it. So the, the, the rule would be for this one, like just enter with caution, knowing what you're getting into. Right? Absolutely. Like, know yeah. that this is going to be a story driven game. Know that the story is going to be a large component to it. And if you like story-driven games, then it's a pickup. It's a solid game. Is that what we're getting Yeah, and, and I'll probably give it a go here again. Um, we just finished playing it the other night, and somebody wanted to play it the next night. And I, they said, well, no, let's let's try some different things, and then we'll, we'll come back to this in a couple weeks. Okay. Fair so, enough. There you go. That is... All the games we have to talk about. Uh, this will be a thing I guess we could do once a month if you guys are interested and want to know more about the games. So we'll do like games that are new, uh, games that are going to be made on Kickstarter, and then games I think would be really cool if we do games that like we fight over as to whether or not we like those games or not. Like, um, mm-hmm. I don't know. What's what's one of those games? That, oh, The Mind. Yeah, it's a great game. And you can't, you can't convince me of Debatable. <laughs> no. Debatable. <laughs> no. I mean, I guess we can have that debate, but I think that'd be a lot of fun. Is it even a game? I mean, I guess you got to start there. <laughs> For another time. And hopefully you guys want to see us do it again. If you want, you can go ahead and like, comment, subscribe, hit that bell button notification, which will be down oh, this way, over here. You can also go ahead and check our live streams every Saturday, Sunday, Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST. It's like a new format. I don't know how to do all this edit end of stuff yeah, thing me, here. And check out my reviews on unfilteredgamer.com. I got a Yeah, you got a bunch of blog posts. We got giveaways on there. And we have our artist section that you can, I guess, you know, what is it? Collaborate with artists and, and make some really cool games. But yeah, thank you guys so much. And as always, we look forward to seeing you guys next time. Next time. Perfect.